This morning, this series is entitled, and I normally don't jump right into my title, but I want to show you on the graphic um, that this series is titled Focused. And as you can see uh, in the beautiful artwork that Doug Johnson does, always does for us, so talented, um, the word used is standing out. And the, the purpose of that is because so many of us... Um, if we really were honest and we weren't using our church answers, um, we, would, we would admit that we sometimes struggle to believe that God can really use us. Me. Um, I can't think of any greater honor in the world than to be used by God. And you think about that. If every Christian is called to be used by God, um, that's greater than any um, dignitary or person of power or a celebrity or anyone on earth asking us to assist them. Okay, how incredible that is. That God would allow us and call us to use uh, be used for him, uh, but we struggle with it. And just to the point, I think that uh, it's easier for you and I to believe that God can use someone else than it is for you and I to believe that God can use us. Have you ever really thought about how easily it is for you to have faith and someone says, let's all pray for so-and-so that God would use them. And it's like your faith just is there. You pray, God, would you bless so-and-so and use them for the kingdom? And you don't even think twice about the fact that they're not perfect. You just assume God can use them and you believe. If you do the same thing for yourself, though, and you say, God, I really want you to use me, all of a sudden, all of these things, these excuses, these reasons start to build up in our mind. And the problem with that, the reason for that is simple. We don't live as that other person. And so we're not inundated with their shortcomings. But we know us really well, don't we? Yes, sir. We know that we are people of problems. We are people of frailty. We are people of dysfunction and we are people of uh, weaknesses and all of these kinds of things. And sometimes the main reason that it's easier for us to believe God can use others, but more difficult to believe that he can use us is because we are bombarded with all the reasons why. The, the things that we know to be true about ourselves. Now, I would love to stand up here today and say, well, all of you guys are wrong. You don't have any weaknesses. You don't have any frailties. God can use you because you're actually perfect. You just need to pep yourself up a little bit. <laughs> but I'd be telling you a lie if I said that about you, and I'd be telling you a lie if I said that about me. I've got even better news, though. I've got better news than the fact that you're not uh, perfect, and the better news is that God doesn't need you and I to be perfect. That's the whole point of this series, and the main reason it, that we think this is because we tend to view other people as closer to perfect than us. But the reality is, and I want you to kind of think of this entire series this month in this light, the reality is that every person that God has ever used, you know, except for the Holy Spirit and Jesus himself, has been um, sinners. Every one of them. And we even tend to do this when we're looking at people in the Bible. I want to show you this. I want to help unpack it this morning. We, we look at people in the Bible and we see people like Moses and Deborah or the disciples. And we see them as they are at the end of their journeys. Moses was the great deliverer that parted the Red Sea. Deborah led a victorious battle campaign uh, against all odds. David was the great warrior, king, and psalmist. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. We always hear people say no one's ever impacted the world more than Paul the Apostle other than Jesus Christ. We think of these biblical characters and we think of them as spiritual giants because we see who they were at the end of their journey. But what we often fail to consider is that when God called to them, when God touched them, when God reached down and said, you're going to do great things for me, 
they were far, at that point, far from the people they ended up being the way you and I see them at the end of their journey. As a matter of fact, they were some messed up people, very much so. You've all heard this, but I just want to share a little bit with you to kind of help bring you into the same uh, vein of thought with me this morning. They weren't spiritual giants. They were normal everyday people, which means they were messed up people. They had all kinds of issues and insecurities and past failures, and God used them in spite of all that. They were shy. Moses didn't want to talk in front of people. Um, they had anger issues. Some of them were extremely violent. Some of them were unqualified in their culture's opinion. Um, some were tax collectors. Some were fishermen, not in that culture, not considered to be in, in any bracket of the spiritual elite. Um, they were uh, hot-headed brothers, the sons of thunder. They weren't called the sons of thunder because they were powerful. They were called the sons of thunder because they would go off on you in a nanosecond. They were hot-headed, ill-tempered. There were doubters in the midst of God's great champions. There was a prostitute in the lineage of Jesus Christ, which really makes all the church people nervous, right, when we start thinking about it. And God used them in incredible ways. And so this series, this introduction is longer than any of the rest in the messages. This series is intended to help you and I stop thinking about or at least pondering about all of the reasons why God can't use us. And let's get focused, okay? Let's get focused on why he can. So the major key to do that is to realize that true greatness, spiritual greatness and spiritual power is, is not a property or a privilege of a few super Christians, all right? The, it is the, the, the ability of the Holy Spirit to use anyone who will yield themselves to the work of the Lord. See, we look at this sometimes, and I don't know what it is about us as human beings, just as a human race, but we always want to elevate a chosen few. We want to pick out some heroes and some great and we want to make these giants and we want to kind of esteem them that they're above everybody else and their level is up here and everybody's down here and there's kind of this culture in the church today where people think that if you're not at a certain level as so and so is or someone else that God can't do through you what he can do through them because you're not at that level and I've just got to be honest with you all that's ridiculous when you think about the people I just talked to you about about and their problems, these were not special people. They were dysfunctional. What they were were willing people, Amen. yielded people, submitted people, changed people. What I'm trying to tell you here this morning is no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, if you're willing to yield yourself to the Lord, he will reach down if he has to scrape the bottom of the barrel, right? That's where he found me. Actually, I was under the barrel, under the rock, so to speak. He will do whatever he's got to do. All he asks is that you and I yield ourselves to him. That's the key. It's his power through a, a willing vessel, not some super Christian or some super spiritual willing, uh, vessel, okay? So today, I want to talk about, each, each message is going to unpack kind of one thing. I want to talk about getting rid of that excuse of our past, being used by God regardless of our past. And so we're going to look at the Apostle Paul in starting in Acts chapter number 9. Verse number 1. But Saul, who was still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went, on to the, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, all of you understand that means any Christians, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light 
from heaven shone around him. And he falling to the ground heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Rise, enter the city and you'll be told what you are to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible worship today. What a wonderful time to just enjoy uh, a, a spiritual atmosphere that is authentic and real. And God, I pray in these next few moments, God, that the sole focus of these thoughts would be helping your people be encouraged to serve you through your power, regardless of their reasons that they think they can. Father, help us to do that. God, in Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing I want to tell you about being used in spite of your past is that Paul, the world famous, the world renowned, the, 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 the name that is synonymous with Christianity the world over the, 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 the man Paul actually used to be Saul. And Saul of Tarsus was a bad dude. I'm just, we can't, we can't color this differently than it is, friends. He was a religious zealot that persecuted the Christian faith. As a young teen, we see the seeds of murder and torture and persecution being sown in Saul's hearts as he is the young lad when Stephen, the first martyr of the church, is stoned to death. Those who threw the stones laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. This was Saul who became Paul. Even as a teenager, he witnessed the bloodshed of religious um, persecution as Stephen was stoned to death. Now, friends, this was a bloody death. Okay, I don't want to go. I know you got fried chicken on the brain. I don't want to go too much into this this morning. Um, but you know, stoning was bad. I mean, they would put a person in a place, often at a lower part uh, elevation, and everyone around would pick up stones, loose stones, and hurl them until the individual was crushed or beaten and bruised to death. So we see that the seed of that is in the heart of this young man. And when he grows up, he is a religious zealot. He is one of the upper echelon of the religious community. He is on his way. He is going through the ranks. He is set for great and terrible things. And Paul, which was then Saul, gets orders to do everything he can to stop the spread of this new Christian movement, the way. And so he literally and personally signed the death warrant of men, women, and children for nothing more than being followers of Jesus Christ. Paul was a murderer. He was an possibly direct, I don't know, but he was definitely an indirect murderer. And he, as a young leader, was responsible for the death of so many Christian people. Now let's put that in a modern day example, okay? Let's say that a few years ago when uh, someone went into the Baptist church in Texas and started shooting people. And did the unthinkable, murdered individuals in that church. And, you know, churches are targets in America today. I will tell you, you can feel safe at Knollwood. If someone does something like that here, it, they're going to wish they had. And we're ready for that kind of thing. But let's get back to the story. I, I want you to understand, it would be like that individual who killed those people in that church in cold blood getting saved. Yeah. What do you do with that? You realize that the sin is the same. Paul was a terrible person. It's hard to believe, isn't it? That he had such a past and that God would choose to use him. You know, if you look at Scripture, Paul's in actually pretty good company. Just give you a little bit of history on some of the spiritual giants we think about this morning. Noah, oh man, Noah saved the world, didn't he? Noah built a boat when it had never rained and people thought he was crazy, and he probably was, but he did what God told him to do, and he saved the human race. 
he and his descendants repopulated the earth and had it not been for Noah then you and I wouldn't be here today so to speak and so he was a great champion of God he kind of saved the whole world and after that great victory being on that boat for that long of time he got off the boat planted a vineyard and said this is good and got tore up drunk and some terrible things happened that I don't even want to talk about in this sermon after that some things that you and I would look and say oh he doesn't qualify at all to be used by God but he was Abraham father Abraham right how many of you learned that kids that song when you were in kids church father Abraham uh, had many sons all that kind of stuff so I didn't go to kids church I don't know it but I heard people talk about it <laughs> sounds like a pretty goofy song to me but it did teach some really good truths Abraham was the father of faith he's listed in the New Testament epistles as the reason you and I one of the reasons we're able to have faith in God and walk with the Lord but the reality is is Abraham had this little problem of telling half truths my mama always told me that a half truth was a whole lie right so he was basically a liar and God used him anyway to bless the nations and then there's Jacob who was known as a deceiver that's what his name even means and God used him to carry on the lineage of Jesus and Moses he was a murderer and he ran from his call and he hid in the backside of the desert it took God 40 extra years to get him ready to be used as the deliverer of Israel from Egypt and then there's David David the great the great psalmist the great warrior the great lusting king that committed adultery with Bathsheba and cost thousands of Israelites their lives at no price of their own but simply because of the sin of David and yet God used this man and then there's Rahab Rahab was a prostitute that somehow God touched her heart and she honored the men of faith and God saved her and she joined the family and then Paul like I said persecuted all these people and God chose him to write two thirds of the New Testament wherever your Bible is today if you have a paper copy or a digital copy two thirds of the New Testament that has changed the world and changed eternity at the words of the pen of a man named Paul is the same guy that did all that terrible stuff I've been talking about so Pastor, why, why are you rehearsing all that? Are we celebrating the fact that people are bad? No, I'm trying to get you to understand that the next time the devil gets on your shoulder and says, well, I know God wants to use you, but he can't use you because there's nothing you've done that these people didn't do. There's nothing that can disqualify you now. Please hear me. You're not going to be used by God doing that stuff, but I'm talking about getting past your past, becoming a repentant, willing vessel, and the old man is, is the old man, okay? We can't stand on the crutch of that and not be used by God. So we all have the old us, okay? Everybody in this room has the before Christ part of who we used to be and we all have a past every single one of us has a past all right it does not disqualify us from God using us unless we choose to let it disqualify God from using us all right so not only was Paul originally Saul God really did forgive Paul when Paul repented this is an amazing thing because he also really forgave you and I when we repented and he really forgives us today when we repent now I know I know I know I know that other people might not forgive us when we repent but God forgives us when we repent when Paul repented Jesus forgave him of his past wiped clean his slate and called him to serve the kingdom of God he does the very same thing for you and I and it doesn't matter friends what our past was see we have much more difficulty forgiving than God does when God forgives he forgets you say pastor how can God forget because he chooses to he's just God and he chooses to forget why would he because he's a God of grace and love and mercy that's why he chooses to Micah 7 and 19 says he's going to have compassion again on us he's going to tread our iniquities underfoot he said God will cast our sins into the depth of the sea in Psalm 103 and 12 says as far as the east is from the west now how many of you are really bad with directions be honest with me 
I've met some folks that get lost going to the mailbox. I mean, they have trouble with the east, the west, the north, the south kind of thing. Had a lady one time, I was trying to give her some directions. She said, oh, just tell me, like, what's beside the road that I turn by? I said, okay, there's a big tree and a, all this kind of stuff. You may not be as you may not be great with directions, but let me tell you that as far as the east is from the west means, if you keep going east, you're never going to get west. And if you keep going west, you're never going to get east. You hear what I'm saying? God has separated the sins of his people. He removes our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. What that means is that when God has forgiven you and I, it is simply impossible impossible and beyond the realm of God to even pull back up what he has chosen to forget and what he's chosen to put past. He's God. So he chooses to forget the past when you and I repent. This is why that forgiveness is what sets me free to be used from the Lord, for the Lord. It's not what you think of me that sets me free to be used from God, for God. It's not what my past accolades or qualifications or successes or my failures or anything else. None of that qualifies me and frees me up to be used by God. One thing does. The forgiveness of Jesus Christ. When you and I stand at the altar of the Lord and we are commissioned and anointed by the Holy Spirit to go out and do the things of God, friends, there is but one qualification to be part of that group. And that is to have our sins washed away by the blood of Jesus at no effort or work or achievement of our own. Isn't that what the Bible says? That by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because you know what? We would boast. We would boast. Yes, we would. You know we would. Don't look at me like that. We brag about everything, man. We brag, you know, from gold medals to quiche dishes. I mean, yeah, we brag about everything. And if we had any way in our power to own any of the um, responsibility for doing something good for God, we would own it. And that's why the Lord says the qualification is to be forgiven and set free. Why does that matter, Pastor? Pastor, it matters because when people disqualify you, their opinion doesn't count. Doesn't matter. When, you're, when your enemy climbs up on your shoulder and whispers in your ear and tries to say, yeah, but you know what you did. Yeah, you know who you are. You know all these things. Listen, the same things are true about everybody else God's ever used. All you've got to do is know that they're under the blood. Yeah. If they're under the blood, you and I are talking to the devil about stuff that God refuses to get in the conversation about because he chooses not to remember what we're discussing. He's out of that conversation because the past is gone. So you're telling me, Pastor, that no matter where I've been, no matter what I've done, God can use me if you'll repent and be submitted. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Not only that... And I want you to be with me here because I don't want you to misunderstand me. Not only that, but God can even use our past to show other people the power of change. Now hear what I'm saying. I am not telling you to go out and buy some weed and get high and do something bad and come in here and repent and then next Sunday say, Pastor, can I testify about what God has done through my life? I want to be a vessel unto the Lord. <laughs> Use me, Lord, don't refuse me. Don't pass me by. Pass, the, anyway, never mind, never mind, never mind. <laughs> it's not what I'm telling you. If that's our heart, we're, we're not really repenting, okay? But what I am saying is that when you and I genuinely and authentically come to Jesus Christ, and the real work of repentance, which is not to just be sorry, it is to be sorry and change, takes place in our life, then our past is not wasted because God, and only God, has the ability to take something so terrible and use it to show someone else who was doing the things we were doing, that if God can change me and use my life, then He can change them and use their life, and even my past can become a testimony of the power of God. It's not my power. It's not a testimony for me. It's a testimony that God is able to change people. And you know, friends, you 
that are changed. How many of you are changed? Be honest, okay? I'm not asking you how many is perfect. I just want to know if you're changed. You are the greatest testimony and the hope of the world that you can show people through your life. Not your perfection, but your life. That if God can do that for you and through you, He can do it for anybody and everybody on this whole planet. And you can hand me information until you're blue in the face, but when I see a changed life, the power and the reality of change touches me and lets me know that's real. That's why the Bible says we overcome him by the word of the Lord and the blood uh, the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It's not that we're giving somebody a word, it's that we're telling them, hey, you knew me. And I want to tell you, I'm not that guy anymore. I'm not perfect by far, but I will tell you, God has so changed and ordered my steps that the guy you see today is not the guy you knew then. And that gives people, even if they don't want to admit it, that gives people a hope down on the inside when they are listening to the lies of the enemy that they will never be any better than they are. That gives them hope that if God changed you, He can change them. Look over at your neighbor and tell him, I know you were bad. Just tell him, I know you were terrible. <laughs> David was so bad, he's red in the face. Look at him over here. <laughs> now look at him and tell him, but I know you changed. <laughs> Isn't it a wonderful, mighty, celebratory experience to know that we're no longer judged by who we were and what we were, but now we are in the family because of the power of Jesus to change us. Friends, everybody should have the opportunity to know the joy of that experience. And you and I live every day whether we have the, you know, the, the correct pronunciation of things or we whether we give it to people in the right terms or we can show them the exact verse or not, every day we are living epistles. Isn't that what Paul said? We are God's writing. We are his letters of love and the power of change to everybody that we encounter. That is so freeing to me to know that I'm not called to perfection. I'm just called to walk in the change of the real work of Jesus Christ in my life. God can use our past. When I got saved, and I'm going to hurry up. I'm almost done. When I got saved, I was working with a group of people and uh, we, we were a lot like those people listed in that stuff I was talking about earlier. Not, not good people at all. And uh, when I got saved, I found out later that um, the, the guys I worked with, the people that knew me the best, because um, if you really want to know someone, you got to live with them or work with them, right? Because they will meet you at the ballpark and shake your hand and smile, but if you get their hamburger out of the refrigerator at work... <laughs> You eat their cheese, it's I'm telling you, man, they coming. <laughs> These people you work with better not touch that cupcake, right? I had a guy one time, this is a true story, side story, but it's true. He, we, we were working in this place and every day food would go missing. People would bring food and it would go missing. And so we started, um, we started writing our name on our food, you know, put, put my name, it would say Joe and it would still go missing. And when we finally caught the guy, we were blasting him. We said, man, I cannot believe you would eat the food out of the refrigerator with somebody else's name name on. He said, oh, I thought that meant it was from you. It's an honest, true story. <laughs> that ain't, but this is, no, I'm just kidding. I got something for you from me. The guys that knew me best were making side bets. Every time I'd walk up, the crowd would go quiet, the conversation would end, and they were making bets on how long this would last for me because they knew me. And you know what? I don't really blame them because if I would have been them and Joe showed up talking about I've been forgiven and I'm a Christian and all this, I'd have probably thought the same thing. But you know, that's been well over 20 years ago, and I'll tell you, I'm not perfect, but the power of God is the power to change. 
right? Some of those very men ended up in church themselves. But listen, that has nothing to do with my ability. Really, all I did was wander my way around and figure out God loved me more than I was. You know, my sin had been covered by the blood. I didn't jump, jump in there with some great evangelism strategy. I just, I was changed. And I'm still changed. Thank God that you and I can be living examples of how God's power changes people. We can show others. They can be used by God, even if they had a past. Friends, as I wrap this up and I am done, we are living examples that God is not looking for perfect people. God is only looking for forgive, for willing people and forgiven people. And that's all we've got to do. All we've got to do. You say, you know, I feel like someone's saying, Pastor, are you telling, are you saying that we shouldn't pray hard? and study and no no not all, any of that we should pray we should study we should fast we should grow but all of that is an outflow of being forgiven that's spiritual growth because I'm forgiven that is in no way shape form or fashion uh, being qualified to be used by God that's what I give God those are spiritual disciplines that I offer God I give God my framework for him to use to develop me but that's my gift to him not his gift to me his gift to me is to forgive Give me by the shed blood of his own son and wipe my slate. That's his gift to me. So this morning, uh, Francis of Assisi said, if God can work through me, he can work through anyone. We've all heard that. But not only can he work through you, friends, he wants to work through you. That's the way I want to leave this today. He just not that he can. He wants to. And I'm going to share with you my absolute favorite quote of all time. And, and, I, and I love quotes. You probably know that by now. I love to read after great thinkers. And this one is actually um, anonymous. We don't know who said it. But it said, if God didn't forgive sinners, heaven would be empty. And not just heaven, but the church and the army of the Lord and the, all those that work for the kingdom of God. If God did not forgive sinners, there would be no pastors, no worship leaders, no bishops, no superintendents, no elders, no teachers, nothing. I'm simply trying to tell you, friend, that if you will just give your life to God, no matter where you've been, what you've done, God can use you. You've got to get focused, not on the reasons why he can't. You've got to get focused on the fact that none of those reasons matter. Anything that I let me, anything that I let keep me from being used by God is on me. It's not on God. He forgives. He empowers. And He can use us. Okay? So would you bow your heads with me? I want to lead everybody through a short prayer before we do an invitation. Because what I, I don't want you to hear me saying that you can live in raw sin and be used by God. That's not what I'm saying. If that's what you're thinking, you've missed the whole point of the message. I'm talking about because you're forgiven, you can be used by God, all right? So I just want us all to pray for just a moment. Father, in this room, as we stand and sit here together, sometimes pride would try to get in our heart and we would try to think we're better than someone else or maybe we're a little more spiritual than the next person or that maybe we've achieved a little bit and we're kind of elite or maybe we're working our way up. We just repent of any of that right now if that be the case. We repent of any spiritual pride and arrogance and we understand right now that when we stand before the throne of Almighty God, the only thing that separates us from eternal punishment is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We are raw and we are undone and we are simply thankful for your blood. So forgive us of any arrogance and pride. And Lord, on the other hand, sometimes we think we can't because we're not as smart as somebody else or we don't have the degree that someone else has or we haven't don't have the family that someone else has or God, we maybe haven't been the places they've been and done the things they've done and maybe it's because we have done things and we've made terrible, terrible failures and sins and mistakes. Lord, in this moment, I pray right now, right now, that you would just roll back the veil and help every person in this room and those that will be watching by video have an awareness right now by, by the Holy Spirit done by you, an awareness that our past does not disqualify us if we will repent and submit ourselves to you. 
Father, you don't need our abilities. You need our availability. And so right now we repent of every sin. Every sin. Every sin. God, and we just submit now our heart willingly and faithfully. God, knowing we're not perfect, but trusting that you will accomplish your purpose through us. God, to be used by you. And when the enemy comes telling lies again, help us to get focused on it's your power through us. It's not the power we have in our own selves to be used by you. And Father, if there's any in this room this morning that are not where they need to be with you, anyone that's not a Christian, not a believer, not a follower of Jesus that just prayed that prayer, I'm praying that they would have the courage, Lord, to just stick with it and trust the process that you will work in their lives. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every